I have a second channel, Cube Comp MTDX. Hey everybody, here we're back again with this uh, Internet Explorer PC. Um, you notice the uh, IE logo on the side of it. <laughs> um, so this is the machine that I used in the previous video um, featuring the laptop Mobile Athlon 64 processor in a desktop configuration. And I haven't actually uploaded that video yet as of to date, which I'm, of course, plan on doing it very soon and I mentioned at the end of the video um, that if you're interested in seeing the Mobile Athlon 64 claw hammer CPU in action and leave a comment I figured a lot of you guys were probably interested in seeing it in action so we're going to actually just go ahead and get this thing installed and see what it can do okay everybody so now we're inside this uh, system looking at the uh, CPU or the CPU cooler rather. So when you're just looking at the thing you wouldn't realize it's actually a mobile a laptop CPU under that cooler. Uh, but once we open this up and take this heatsink fan off of here you'll clearly notice right away that something isn't quite right. And of course if you watched the previous video you would already know what it looks like but It's like, yeah, where's the where's the heat spreader at? <laughs> there is none. At least not on this one. So yeah, that's the that's the funny thing about these about these uh, particular CPUs. Well, most laptop CPUs don't have a heat spreader on them. I say most because there's actually a few that do. Some of the older ones, like older than this, I've seen actually have heat spreaders on them. Particularly stuff from Intel. And clean off the uh, heat sink fan assembly. Doing this off camera. Won't take but just a sec. And just some rubbing alcohol and a napkin. Just to get rid of the old thermal paste. So yeah, it's interesting that it was once a time where uh, desktop CPUs and laptop CPUs share the socket. This is a uh, socket 754. And if you watched the last video near the end, you'll see where I pulled, or yeah, where at least I, I tore down a laptop and showed you guys the other Mobile Athlon 64 that I have. And you can see the socket in that laptop is just like this one. So look at the bottom of the uh, processor, it looks no different. Practically no different than your regular desktop Athlon 64 or socket 754 CPU. So I'm going to grab this other chip, which is a Mobile Athlon 64 3000 Plus. This one's based on the Clawhammer core, which is also a core that is used in desktops. However, I think this one is refined for uh, for mobile use. And it too is missing the uh, integrated heat spreader. So when you look at this particular chip, you can imagine this this thing. This is a uh, a desktop claw hammer CPU without a heat spreader, pretty much, and a couple other different refinements there. So the one we pulled out is a Mobile Athlon 64 Plus Newark core, which I think is kind of similar to the Venice core, except it has more cache. And this is the claw hammer, noticeably larger. Runs a little hotter too. So I'm curious to see how this one will do. So we're going to drop this one in. I'm also curious that this motherboard will work with it. I think it probably will because I think this is actually an older revision CPU than the one we just took out. I to get that old thermal compound off of there. That's probably been on there since 2005, 2006, 2004, that time period. I think we'll get it all off of there. 
It should be non-conductive, so I don't think it'll cause any problems. Okay, so now we're going to apply some thermal compound. And, <clears throat> of course, a lot of people, when they apply thermal paste, they just put a blob in the center and and rely on the pressure of the uh, cooler to spread it. Sometimes I'll do that, but a lot of times I just apply it in a spot and spread it manually. Personally, I think you would definitely want to do that on any sort of application where you're applying directly to a die. Now, I apply this particular stuff kind of thick because it's not a it's a pretty cheap end thermal paste. I bought it a long time ago when I was in a pinch. It's a uh, it was sold at Radio Shack before they went belly up. The thing is, with these, with these uh, processors as well as chipsets and video cards, where you have exposed dyes like this, you want to make sure that the entire thing is covered with thermal paste because you don't want to have hot spots. And of course, normally. A heat spreader would take care of this, but you don't have a heat spreader in this case. Your die is making direct contact with the cooler. Now, I'm personally not a real big fan of this thermal compound. As I said, it's kind of it's kind of thin. It did, it did seem to work pretty good so far. I, I used it on the previous chip as well as the uh, Enforce 3 250 chip. Yeah, this is a silicon based thermal compound. So we'll make sure that whole die does have paste on it. Now some will spread around, but this this kind of insurance policy to make sure the entire thing is covered. Because last thing you want to have is again hot spots. Because that could actually damage the uh, the uh, processor. Because one part of the CPU where the thermal sensor is could be reading a lot lower than other parts. That may be not getting good thermal transfer. Yeah, this core is a little it's a little weird to apply. You just gotta be careful with it. It's it feels weird applying or installing heat sinks on on processors that don't have a heat spreader. Now let's give it a little bit of a twist here. Make sure it's on there. As you may have seen, this core is specially designed for these CPUs without a uh, heat spreader. So if you haven't watched the previous video, this uh, the previous processor I pulled out of here, as well as this cooler, came from a desktop, a retail desktop made by EverX that was sold with that Mobile Athlon 64 CPU. Now you can imagine shopping for a computer and looking at a desktop and making note of a mobile CPU installed inside of it. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, personally I wish laptops and desktops, they, I, I, I do wish they, they had shared a, a socket. That way you could actually use laptop CPUs in a desktop build because let me be honest I got a, I got a ton of uh, of laptop CPUs particularly uh, like A series APUs I got a bunch of them things anyways we're going to get this thing up and running and see how it does okay I'm going to hook everything up and we'll give this thing a try 
see how it does with this CPU. Just got a few cables to plug in here. Okay guys, this will be the first startup. It does appear to see the uh, processor. Let's make sure it's not a uh, Not sure what's going on here. Maybe it's going to set all this back to uh, standard. There we are. Yeah, this motherboard is just—it's just really uh, it's really really finicky. Not sure why it's still holding settings from previous overclock with the old processor. I may have to reset the CMOS on this thing. I don't know. Let's just go back to standard. Let's set the memory back to auto. I had to uh, had to adjust the clock, the memory clock down because I was uh, increasing the uh, bus on the other CPU, which I am going to try overclocking this one to see what it can do too, just for fun. Okay, just making sure that our uh, CPU temps ain't running away. All right, let's try to get into Windows. Let's pull up CPU Z. And horror monitor as well. Yeah, it's definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely slower. Yeah, 100% CPU, I figured that. Max out. Okay, I guess I'm going to relaunch HW Miner. Let CPU Z load first. Yep, claw hammer. Wow, this is this is, <laughs> and it's running. No wonder it's it's running at 800 megahertz. This board, I tell you guys, this board is just weird. I got to go in back into the BIOS. No wonder this thing is running so freaking slow. We're only running at 800 megahertz, guys. Jeez. And we're running the RAM at PC 2100. Ouch. Yeah, let's. Uh, Let's fix that right now. The motherboard did the same thing last time.
So I got set and manual. And you can see it's running the multiplier just four times. So we got to set it up to nine times. As high as it goes. So this is, I think, so apparently this is a 1.8 gigahertz CPU. I'm not sure if it's applying the correct CPU voltage or not. We'll, we'll find out here in a sec if it's stable or not. And let's go check out the memory. Why is it running the memory so slow? This is what, this is what kills me. It was running at 266. It needs to be at 400. Like, holy cow. Yeah, the auto the the auto stuff on this board is just it's just not working. <laughs> you gotta I'm having to go in and manually set a lot of stuff. See it was running at 133 megahertz like crap. Okay, let's uh let's apply that. Let's go back in and see what it's doing now. There. The uh, memory seems to be doing better now. Yep, 1.8 gigahertz. So, the, of course, the uh, last CPU was 2.2 uh, gigahertz stock. Yeah, now it's running the memory at 200 megahertz. Let's go back into Windows. Okay, startup was still pretty slow, but it was noticeably faster this time compared to last time. What a difference. You can definitely hear that Hitachi Death Star drive. Yeah, those those Hitachi Death Star drives, they were some of my, they were probably one of my favorite IDE drives from that time period. I used to find them included a lot of times in an e machines computer. As a matter of fact, this one probably came from an e machines originally. Almost like did I even click on CPU Z? I don't think I did. I'm so used to clicking the 64 bit version because that's normally what we work with now is 64 bit. But in this case, we're working with 32 bit. Yeah, everything seems to be loading a lot better now that the uh, CPU is running at its intended stock frequency of 1.8 gigahertz. So as I was saying earlier, look at look at the technology, look at the size of this thing. It's 130 nanometers or 0.13 microns, I think is what that is. It's been a while since I've seen that number. Uh, for example, the Pentium 4 Northwoods. That was their that was their process size. So uh, we have one meg of L2 cache. And of course is their memory. Nothing too much more to see here. Let's uh, let's check our temps. Make sure the core ain't running super hot. And I'm expecting this one to run a bit hotter than the other one. Consider this one has a higher TDP. And of course, it's actually it's actually idled down right now. I'm going to pull up dual chrome and let's just double check the CPU world information just to make sure this thing is running like it's intended to be run. And of course, I, this video will not be complete without overclocking this thing. You see what it could do. I 
So guys, this is what this is what browsing the internet is like on a single core in 2020. On an old single core CPU. Yep, this is a 1.8 gigahertz CPU. Make sure the V core is so make sure the V core is using this correct. Okay, where is all the information at? It's still loading apparently. Yeah, 1.5. So this thing is actually uh, this motherboard is actually running it at too low of a voltage. As a matter of fact, I think it's still running it at the uh, voltage I had selected when I was overclocking the previous CPU. So I'm going to inc I'm going to go into the BIOS. I'm going to increase that to 1.5, and I'm going to start overclocking this thing and see what we can get out of it. Okay, everybody. So now I've uh, tried my best with overclocking this thing. And as I suspected, uh, the claw hammer is not going to be a good overclocker. Um, yeah, it was originally a 1.8 gig CPU. I was only able to get stable at 2.07 gigahertz, which is not a whole lot more than the stock voltage, and that included having to uh, bump up the uh, CPU uh, core voltage quite a bit, um, up to about 1.55. So yeah, this this old CPU definitely not um, definitely not a good overclocker for, at all. Um, in comparison to the previous uh, Mobile Athlon 64, that Newark that was a 2.2 uh, gigahertz, um, I was able to get it stable at what well, I think it was like 2.64, which is uh, about a little over 400 megahertz overclock, which for a CPU of that time period, it's not too bad. Um, I would say that previous Athlon 64, if you had an old Socket 754 desktop that you want to drop something pretty cool into, that would actually, I think, be a, a nice little option because it would get you the 90 nanometer core, but also one mega cache, and as well as the uh, the higher uh, headroom for, of course, the higher max temperature it could run at. So. I think that kind of wraps up for the claw hammer, uh, Mobile Athlon 64 3000 plus. So it's a pretty hot running CPU for a mobile, for at least for a mobile chip. I mean, what was it, 89 watts? I think it was a stock TDP or something like that. It's definitely, definitely a good bit of heat, um, and it's just overall the the the, the claw hammer was just not, just not that great of an overclocker, and I mean. For those who don't know, I've 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 been playing. I just many years ago, I've messed around with the uh, with the old K8s on both the socket 754 and the 939. And on the 754, it always seems like the uh, if you had to choose between a Venice core and a and a claw hammer, the Venice core was usually the one that would overclock better because it was based off a smaller process, ran a little cooler, and stuff like that. So. I think that just about wraps it up for this video. So that was a look at the other Mobile Athlon 64 CPU. The other laptop CPU. Okay everybody, well surprise surprise, I put the other uh, CPU back in the Mobile Athlon 64 3400 Plus, the uh, Newark CPU, and we were able to achieve a much better overclock. Um, so now we're actually running at 2.75 gigahertz, which is definitely better than what we was running before. Um, this because I was able to break past the 240 megahertz uh, roadblock in the bus, and it had to do with the memory. Um, so now the <laughs> now pretty much the uh, the roadblock is anything above 250. I tried 255 and it wouldn't boot. But 250 it boots and it runs fine. Um, I do have the voltage up a bit um, to keep it stable. So the memory is running at right about uh, 200 megahertz it appears. So I got the timing set at 3449. I could adjust those down to be more of to be more on the uh, JDAC3 specification. I wasn't sure exactly what this thing was doing with the RAM, but um, 
I'd say this is pretty impressive. It's a uh, 550 megahertz overclock um, out of this CPU, which is that's I'd say it's pretty impressive for a CPU from its time. Um, I'd say it's a lot better than what we was getting out of that claw hammer uh, CPU. That and it's and it's interesting. I should note the claw hammer CPU, although it's missing the uh, heat spreader like you would expect for the uh, mobile chip. This one does not actually reference mobile on it. Anywhere, but the uh, model number starts with AMA, which I believe would reference mobile. I mean, obviously this chip came out of a, uh, a laptop, so it's, it's really, it's a laptop CPU. So, uh, yeah, this one here, it just the performance overall, it's not as fast, it doesn't overclock as well, it runs hotter, uses more power. So I definitely have to say, this CPU here, um, if you happen to get your hands on one of these things, it would it would be pretty cool to have in a uh, older 754 desktop. You could overclock it really well. Um, and mind you, this is with the factory heatsink fan that came with that Everex computer. This is <laughs> this ain't a real like high end cooler by any means. It's just your aluminum heatsink fan, and it's running. Right now, it's not even, not even running at full speed. I mean, you can't really hear it. I did adjust the fan curve since the last time I had this chip in here, because I it was it was ramping the fan up a little earlier. But now it's uh, <laughs> I mean the the so far the max temp we got out of the CPU was just 48 degrees C, uh, which is not bad, not bad for for all things considered. <laughs> so I def I definitely have to say this one. This one overclocks pretty well. Uh, the other one, not so much. But anyways, hope y'all enjoyed this video. And it comes to show there was once a time where AMD, for example, released laptop CPUs that were socket compatible and actually really compatible with desktop motherboards. So you can install one of these things in a desktop. Pretty cool, huh? Hope y'all enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Well, everybody, that's it for this video. But don't forget, there's a lot more interesting stuff on the channel to check out. Also, if this is your first time visiting this channel, feel free to subscribe to keep your channel. And also, don't forget to tick the bell so that we will get notified of new video posts. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. But if you really didn't like it, there is the alternative option available as well. Also, feel free to check out my second channel, CubeComp MTDX. There you'll find videos about bicycling, weather, elevator tours, and all sorts of other neat, interesting stuff. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Feel free to come back, and thank you for your support.